fun being up here. I get to see things that, from a perspective that you all don't see. Um, get to see all the, the, the parents and grandparents stand up and take all their little kids out. And uh, it's fun watching them, watching them go and do that. But it made me think, you know, um, if you have kids or grandkids down there, or even if you don't, I would encourage you to, to stop down there after the service and say thank you. We've got a, a team of, of people down there, men and women, mostly ladies, but we've got some guys that are down there as well that really love the opportunity to invest in our kids, and they, they do it with a joyous heart. So um, I, I think it'd be great if, if we went down once in a while and said thank you, even if we don't have a kid that's there. And, uh, and also, I mean, sometimes you get to see some of the faces of folks that are down there all the time up in here, and uh, Rosie Bruce is one of our faithful teachers has been teaching back there how how long have you been teaching in kids zone ten plus years yeah pretty incredible um, so I just wanted to to pause and and take that uh, liberty with you all and say thank you publicly to our team um, they also we we finished remodel down there they've got a screen down there so they can see what's going on up here and next week, we'll have sound down there as well. So <laughs> well, I'll just have to speak really loudly into the mic, keep her awake, and it'll be, it'll be good. But I, I just wanted to mention as well that there was a, a guy who said, you know, it'd be nice. We've got a security team, and there's somebody stationed down in the main office. And um, he, he said, it'd be nice if you're that person to, have, to be able to hear what's going on in the sanctuary. And so he took it on himself to to do the research and fund a project to get sound there and in the the uh, kid zone as well. This is a cry room right over here. Maybe you didn't know that. But it's ever since I've been here for almost nine years, it's been a cry room. But nobody, not many people go in there because there's no sound. So there's sound now, or there will be next week. So anyway, just a couple of quick updates there for you as well. Let me pray for us again. God, thank you for giving each of us gifts and abilities that you want to use to, to better your kingdom, to advance your causes. Thank you for those who are using those gifts and for those who are trying to figure out where the gifts can be used. And I just pray that you'll guide them. Thank you for the, the gift of your word and the gift of community. Thank you for the gift that we enjoy of the love of one another when we go through difficult times and when we go through struggles and when we, we have questions to know that there's a brother or sister or a group of folks who will be there for us. Thank you for the love that you give us through the body, this body of Christ. Be with us now as we look into your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is a beautiful area in the Holy Land. It is... Uh, natural springs that flow from, from through the area come together to establish one of the four headwaters for the Jordan River, all of which flow down into the Sea of Galilee, causing it to teem with life. Now, for all of its natural beauty, and, and I, I, I toyed with putting some pictures up there, but you can go and, and check out Caesarea Philippi for yourself uh, on, on Google and, and see this. It's lush, it's green, and, and there's water that flows right out of the middle of it. Now, during Old Testament times, during the, when, when uh, Greece was in charge, when Rome was in charge, before, during, and after Jesus' life, this beautiful area was used as one of the, the most ungodly places on the face of the planet. There were 14 temples for the worship of Baal that were scattered across the area. Pilgrims from all over the world or at least that the known world, would, would bring idols and place them in little notches that were carved out of the rock. And they would pray to those small little idols, the icons, um, asking them to protect them and watch over them, give them traveling mercies. There was a temple for the worship of Caesar Augustus. There was another for Zeus. And the area was especially well known for the worship of, of the, the Greek god Pan. Now, that's another one you could look up on, on Google if you wanted to, although you probably don't need to, because you can imagine what Pan was all about. The rituals involved appalling and, and gross sex.
sexual immorality. Now, a spring originally came out through a cave where Pan was thought to have been born. And this cave was, was uh, the spring and the, the cave that, that housed it was so massive that as they couldn't plumb the depths of the spring, and they, they came up with this idea that their fertility gods all lived there during the winter. The Romans called it the Rock of the Gods, but the common people called it the Gates of Hell. Jesus chose Caesarea Philippi as the place to make an astounding promise. After Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered Jesus' question, who do, you, who do men say that I am? And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. After Jesus made that proclamation, and he affirmed what Peter said. He said, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now another, I think more to the point translation of that phrase is, and the gates of Hades or hell shall not withstand its assault. Jesus' church was not established at the temple in Jerusalem. It was not established at the synagogue in Capernaum. He established his church at Caesarea Philippi, the most godless, sinful, hedonistic site in that part of the world. Now the rock that Jesus referred to was probably not Peter, as some say. And the rock was probably not the confession that Peter made that Jesus was the Christ, Son of the living God. Instead, I think, if you were standing there with Jesus, I think he was pointing at this rock where all of these false idols were, where all of this false worship was taking place, and he was saying, on this rock, or over this rock in authority over this rock I will build my church he was saying that the church would have dominion over all false gods and then he said the gates of Hades will not be able to withstand its assault in other words the mission of his church is to attack the gates of hell wherever they are. We live in an increasingly sinful era, an increasingly sinful country, and it's exactly where the church is supposed to be. It's exactly where the church is supposed to thrive. So this is where this passage, and I think... Jesus' point gets even more serious. If we are not assaulting the gates of hell, if we are not assaulting the gates of hell, then we might be a religion, we might be a denomination, we might even be an institution, but we are not the church. Because when the church is established, then the gates of hell cannot withstand its assault. We are the church when we attack hell strongholds wherever we find them. Pretty strong words, aren't they? Not really what we think about. But the reality is we are in a battle. And the degree to which we engage in that battle is the degree to which we are functioning as his established church. Well, one of the questions that come to mind is what, what kind of weapons are we supposed to wield in this battle? How are we supposed to be assaulting the gates of hell? Help me out here. What are some of the weapons that Christians and the church have been equipped with to fight spiritual warfare? What would some of those be? The sword of the spirit of the word of God. 
What else? Again? Prayer? Anything else? Shield of faith, love. When, when you think about it, you, you can begin to understand what these things are. The, the problem is when we think of warfare, we think of Arnold Schwarzenegger. We think of Sylvester Stallone. We, uh, now, younger people, who would you think of? I'm trying to think. <laughs> you know, we, we, think of, we think of the, the, the armada of, of uh, you know, the, the naval armada of the United States of America. We think of uh, F-16s. We think of, we think of things like that. And those are not the weapons that he's talking about. He says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. One of the most effective weapons that we can yield, and it, it's, really, it's really difficult to conceive of this as a weapon. But one of the most effective weapons that we have at our disposal is love. And love is not an empty thing that's just centered on a feeling. Love is a choice to do the right thing to benefit someone even if they hurt us. To care for someone even if they hate us. That's the kind of love that, that knocks down the gates of hell because hell does not know what to do with that love shows that we are serious followers of Jesus I mean Jesus summarized what it meant to be a follower of his with these words in John 13 very well known words let me give you a new command this is from the message version by the way love one another in the same way I loved you you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. They don't recognize us because we picket at an abortion clinic. They don't recognize us because we, we feed hungry people. They recognize us because of the way we care for one another love. Love is one of the most powerful weapons that we have at our disposal to bring the fight to the gates of hell. I want to share a heartfelt thank you to many of you who have been loving us well during this time of sadness and, and loss. Um, Thank you for the cards and the texts. Thank you for the emails, the notes of support and encouragement, all those that you've showered us with. Um, last week, we got a call from a couple asking if they could stop by and bring us something. They told us they wouldn't stay long. My doorbell rang, and at the, at the door was a couple, and this is what they had for us. What do you notice about this? Color. Very colorful. Brighten up, brighten up my day just looking at it. What else do you notice about it? All fruit. It's healthy stuff. It's good. Wholesome. You, you, you can eat it all. What else? Yeah. And it's heavy. It was not not what I expected. But it was everything we needed. We had a time when we had family over and uh, just right after this couple brought this. And uh, everyone was kind of, you know, we're talking, but it's conversation was lagging a little bit because it was uncomfortable. We're all still... In, in a lot of pain and um, uh, we asked if anybody wanted anything and everyone said no And I don't know how it happened but, but we pulled out the thing of, of fruit and we put it on the counter and before you knew it conversation was back up and everybody was enjoying the fruit this really 
wasn't the gift, though. The gift that this couple gave us was something that I think every single one of us can give. The thing I like about this gift is it's abundant, it's practical, it's healthy, it's generous, it's compassionate, it's love. And I want to say thank you so much to that couple that brought that to us. But this gift is not the real gift. And it, it didn't strike me until I was thinking about, I mean, honestly, this was not the sermon I was going to preach today. Um, but God is, I think, got something very practical and very real for us that he wants us to understand. So often throughout each day, I felt thankfulness to God well up inside of me because of the generosity and the kindness and the love that's been poured out on us. And we have been receiving the gifts not just simply as a card or as a prayer or as an email, but rather in the way that Paul described a generous giver. He was, he was speaking of a rather poor group of Macedonian believers who heard about a need that was in the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem. And they begged Paul to let them give. And Paul, I, I imagine, probably said to them, look, you all don't have much. Just pray. God's going to meet these folks' needs. And they're like, no, no, no. We want to give. Listen to what he said. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. The true gift this couple gave to us was not the gift of fruit. It was a gift of themselves. They gave to us to let us know we loved them, or that they loved us, I mean. And it really caused us to, re to realize just how much we appreciate their friendship and their love. For such a generous gift, thank you is not enough. Now let me be careful here. I don't want to denigrate all that I just said or the gift of themselves that was given to us. But they were not the originators of this gift. When left to our own devices, humans tend to be selfish. We tend towards self-protection, self-preservation, self-promotion. But when faith in Jesus brings the Holy Spirit into us, we all begin a lifelong journey of transformation where he makes us like the believers of Macedonia who begged to give. Give us this favor and let us contribute. When faith in Jesus brings the Spirit in, he begins that process of changing every single one of us. In the message passage we looked at in 2 Corinthians 10 he concludes it by this in these way, with, with these words because of this decision the decision to walk by faith not by sight we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look we looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong as you know we certainly don't look at him that way anymore now we look inside and we see and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. The NIV translates it, is a new creation. It's created new. The old life is gone. The new life burgeons. Look at it. Look at it. Look at what he does. So in a very real way, the gifts given were not the fruit. They were not the cards. They were not the emails, the prayers, the words of encouragement. They were not even the persons themselves. Since the gift originated with the Spirit of God who transformed the lives of the givers 
by his grace, instilling in them and instilling in us a desire to give, a desire to love, a desire to be there in someone else's pain and sorrow. The true gifts that have been given to us and that we can all give to others in their time of pain and sorrow is the gift of God's fruit produced in our lives as we yield ourselves more and more to the Holy Spirit. Imagine with me that you are a tree or you're this bowl of fruit and somebody comes and bumps into you or they notice this fruit here and they're like, that looks really good. Mm. And they get to enjoy the fruit of your life. I mean, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about God's Spirit having the opportunity to, to infect us with Himself. And we should not ever be the same again. And every single year, like a fine wine, the fruit of our lives should age and should become better and should become more attractive and should become more appealing. Imagine that that fruit abundantly fills your life and drops into the hands of those who accidentally bump into you. Take it from the, the bowl even if they run into you with malice. One of the things that stood out to me from the message when Dr. Gene Sealander preached last Sunday was when he said, people need to bump into Jesus, but oftentimes before they can bump into Jesus, they're going to bump into us first. And the question that, that really reverberates in my mind is when they bump into me, what, what falls off the tree of my life into their hands? What are they going to be able to grab from the bowl of fruit that is my life? Will it refresh them? Will it put a sour taste in their mouth? Will it make them think, I don't ever want to do that again? Or will it make them say, well, maybe there's something to this. And as we do that, then not only can our life witness for him, but then he gives us the opportunity to witness with our words. That's another piece of fruit that people can enjoy. So the fruit that, that when they bump into us that they might enjoy is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Then he concludes that by saying against such things there's no law. No law can stop those. But God confronts those who are currently on the other side of the gates of hell with that kind of fruit so that he can set them up to hear the message of reconciliation, the message of the gospel, and they can then bear more fruit by putting their faith and trust in Christ. This is how 2 Corinthians completes that thought, 2 Corinthians 5. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him. He reconciled us to himself, is how the NIV translates it. And then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us, then, the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and, and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. God is standing there right now with his arms open wide and says, come, I'm here. Let's be reconciled. Let's be in relationship. The fruit of a changed life and the fruit of sharing that life changing faith with others is a pretty complete picture of what I think Jesus had in mind when he said in John chapter 15 
This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The fruit is a changed life, and then changing other people's lives as well. Pastor Rick Messer shared um, this story with me this week, and I, I thought it was really appropriate. Um, part of it I'm going I'm to read to you. Junior and Jackie Rodriguez are church planners with the Nazarene Church. They've helped to birth five different churches. Um, and even though they are from Brazil, they've planted and are now pastoring a church in Argentina. They got into the building that they're in right now um, at a very cheap price. And it's in the middle of a, uh, an urban, air, urban city uh, center. And um, they got it as, uh, for a cheap price because it had, used to be an illegal abortion clinic. And the owner and the one who ran the clinic died in the building. And they didn't find their body for several months afterwards. So the people in the neighborhood thought the building was cursed. So this pastor and his wife and two little kids moved in. And they began a church. And the church began thriving. Well, one of the interesting things that happened was there was a peach tree in their backyard. And the peach tree had been dead, never had produced one piece of fruit. Well, as soon as the pastor and his family moved in and this church started, the tree began producing fruit. I'm not making this up. It really happened. It's happening today. The tree began producing fruit. And um, there was so much fruit that they, they couldn't keep it off the ground. It, it fell on the ground in the backyard, and it fell over the fence into the neighbor's yard. Well, one day, after quite some time with lots of peaches on the ground, the neighbor came over to visit with Jackie. She knocked on the door, and she said, I've come about the peach tree. And, and Jackie said, oh, well, I'm, I'm so sorry. We're, we would be happy to come into your yard and clean up all the, the, the peaches. You know, we didn't realize it was going to do that, so we're sorry for the problem. Well, the lady said, no, it's okay. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not coming to complain about the peaches. What I want to do is, is I want to I ask a question. So I'm just going to let her say it. For the last 20 years, I've lived next door. This house has been an abortion clinic, and the peach tree has been dead. It has produced no fruit, not a single peach. But when you moved in with your church, it suddenly came alive and became fruitful. I wanted to know what happened. Did you put a spell on the tree? <laughs> Jackie was surprised but prepared, and she said, No, there is no spell. All I can tell you is that there was a dark place, that this was a dark place of death, but now it's a shining place of light and life. I guess that's why God is blessing our little peach tree. Their neighbor was intrigued about Jesus and the claims of the Bible. She began coming to their church and is now a thriving Christian. Jesus establishes his church in the very seat of the enemy's territories. He brings life where the enemy intends death. He brings light where the enemy intends darkness. He brings truth where the enemy intends confusion and lies. He brings love where the enemy spews hatred. What is the gate that you are facing. See, I don't think that the church is just when we gather. The church is you and me. And as we walk throughout this world and we, we lament the fact that our, our politics are changing things, that laws are being passed that we're not comfortable with, that our country seems to be turning its back more and more and more on God... And we wonder what in the world we can do. And we've got some things that, that we're trying to do as a congregation. But you and I are all missionaries every single day of our lives. Every single day of our lives. 
we go out into the world every day walking and everywhere we go there's fruit somebody can take there's fruit that somebody can benefit from from our lives so the question we have to ask is what gate is it that God is wanting me to assault today what gate is it that he wants me to assault tomorrow and my weapon's not going to be an AK-47 it's not going to be an M-16 it's not going to be a grenade my gate my uh, my weapon is going to be love it's going to be peace it's going to be joy it's going to be faith the gate that we faced was Connie's dad's death and you all assaulted that gate with love are you discouraged maybe there's a an encroachment of the enemy in your own life are you disillusioned are your dreams broken laying in pieces at your feet is there someone in your life that you know is in pain is experiencing sorrow has a broken heart assault those gates with the fruit that God's spirit has been producing inside of you and those gates will not be able to withstand that assault they will fall Jesus established his church a local congregation and each individual follower of Jesus in the very seat where the enemy wants to thrive and he puts us there because the gates cannot withstand the assault of his church when someone is hurting and the enemy wants them to be discouraged or think God has given up on them in the name of Jesus love them love them if you know someone who's hurting and you don't really know what to do just let them know you love them and you're praying for them and you're there to talk if they want bring them a simple gift you don't even have to say anything this couple came over they, they told me ahead of time we're not going to stay and when they came to the door they had this and we, we exchanged few words but it spoke volumes because because the gift wasn't necessarily the gift of them it was the gift of love and it was the gift of God working through them in our lives but they had to be willing they had to be in tune with what the, tr the Holy Spirit was doing in them when someone clearly inspired by the evil one kills others in the name of Allah or in the name of Jesus we must stand against that evil with all the weapons at our disposal with God's word with prayer with love with peace with gentleness kindness self-control with faith when human life is devalued as is in the case of the laws being passed around our country encouraging infanticide then we must stand and we must fight and bring the assault against that gate of hell because that gate cannot withstand the weapons of truth of love of grace of faith when we resist the devil James tells us he will flee in your worship folder Tyler pointed out that we're gathering up a group of folks to go to a movie on Thursday night um, we showed the clip of it a, a couple weeks ago and, and it'll be in the um, it was in the Friday blast again the last couple of weeks um, it's the movie's called unplanned and maybe you're thinking you know I don't really know what to do about a, this abortion thing or especially the infanticide where they're they're calling them after birth abortions because um, they don't want to use the word infanticide but basically a child is completely born viable and they they kill it 
Um, and it is, it is it is a heinous, wrong sin that cannot continue. But we can't do everything, but we can do something. So we're going to go to this movie on Thursday. I'm going to encourage everyone to go. Buy your own tickets. Just meet us there at 7 o'clock. Then next Sunday, we're going to have a life class, and we're going to debrief. We're going to talk about it. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God what he wants us to do about it, how he wants us to be involved. I want to encourage everyone to be there. You might not be able to go to the 7 o'clock showing. It may sell out, I hope. So you might have to do a different one. But it's at the United Artists Colorado Mills. And uh, on the Thursday, the 28th, I hope you'll be there with us and be there with us next Sunday as we discuss. Um, I know we've got many mind students who are on spring break right now. So if you're a mind student, uh, and you spread the word around for them as well to make sure they, they know about this. But when human life is devalued, life that was given to us by a gift as a gift from God so that we could bear his image, we must say no. That shouldn't happen. I remember the motto of my high school wrestling team. The motto was anyone, anytime, anywhere. Great testosterone boosting motto for a bunch of guys, right? There weren't any women on our wrestling team at the time. Anyone, anytime, anywhere. Let's adopt, adapt, I should say, that motto. You know, we believe that God has called us to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. That's what we believe God's called us to do as a church. So adapting that motto could look something like this. My challenge for us would be that we be a force for good everywhere, every time, with everyone. I think God wants us to love like Jesus and be a force for good everywhere, every time with everyone let's pray thank you God for the kindness that you showed us when you sent your son to die in our place so that our sins could be forgiven and we could become your children Lord may the fruit of that life bear much more fruit may you be pleased with our lives and as we go wherever we go and encounter the gates of hell remind us who we are remind us what you've called us to do and may we have the courage to simply trust you and to love and to show grace to be a person of peace, to show mercy, to use faith as a muscle to encounter the enemy wherever he is and defeat him by your power. Make us a force for good and golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus.